We begin our show this evening with Medea Benjamin, a prominent Washington activist who has written a book about U.S.-Saudi relations and has lacked no courage whatsoever in making her feelings known about it in very public places. Obama, don't meet with the war criminal. Don't do business with the bloody Saudi monarchy. Stop the bloody regime in Saudi Arabia. Stop the killing in Yemen. Stop the killing in Yemen. The Saudi regime is killing women and children in Yemen. Stop the bloody Saudi monarchy. The Saudi regime has blood on its hands. We're looking now in depth at the relationship between the United States and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and joining us to do that is Medea Benjamin. She's co-founder of Code Pink for Peace and author of several books, including Inside Iran, The Real History and Politics of the Islamic Republic of Iran, and Kingdom of the Unjust Behind the U.S.-Saudi Connection. Medea Benjamin, welcome to CN Live. Nice to be on. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to begin by just setting some historical context between the relationship between the Saudi uh, Kingdom and the United States. It was uh, three years after Great Britain, which created Saudi Arabia, recognized the kingdom that the U.S. in May of 1931 also uh, extended diplomatic recognition to Saudi Arabia. And at the same time that that happened, <coughs> excuse me, the Saudi King Saud granted a concession to the U.S. company Standard Oil of California. That allowed them to explore for oil in the country's eastern province. At the same time of recognition, there was an oil deal. The, the company gave Saudi Arabian government 35,000 pounds and also paid assorted rental fees and royalty payments for that concession. It was only three years later in 1938 that Standard Oil actually struck oil in Saudi Arabia. And then in 1944, they changed the company's name to Aramco. In 1950, the Saudis demanded a 50-50 split in profits, which they got. The oil companies then got uh, tax allowances from the U.S. government to make up for that added profit they were given to Saudi Arabia. In 1988, Saudi Arabia nationalized the oil company, calling it Saudi Aramco, which uh, now is about to be put up for an initial public offering. The U.S. Uh, only sent their ambassador to Saudi Arabia in 1943, uh, several years after recognizing it. Uh, that year, on 16 February 1943, President Roosevelt declared, quote, that the defense of Saudi Arabia is vital to the defense of the United States. And therefore, he made uh, the Lend-Lease program extended to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Roosevelt met, of course, very famously with King Abdulaziz on the USS Murphy in 1945 in the Suez Canal. And that, at that meeting, they formally solidified the relationship between the two countries. Saudi Arabia had agreed to remain neutral during the Second World War but they allowed the Allied powers to use their airspace. In 1951, the Mutual Defense Assistant Agreement was signed between the two countries, which allowed the U.S. to trade arms to Saudi Arabia and to have a U.S. military training mission centered in Saudi Arabia. This is the beginning of the long relationship of arms deals between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia in exchange for oil. That is basically the relationship it carries on till today, with the Trump administration have concluded with the Saudis the largest arms deal in history. There was a bump in the road, however, in 1973, when King Faisal, 
uh, said that Saudi Arabia would take part in the oil embargo because of the 1973 war with Israel. And that caused the US and the Saudis to rupture to some extent. But a year later, the oil embargo was ended and the US uh, and Saudi Arabia started signing military contracts again, as much as $2 billion in 1975. During the Cold War, U.S. worked with the anti-communist Saudi Arabia to sponsor Hadis in the region for regime change, and the relationship continued through the 1980s in the Afghan war and the so-called war on terrorism, including in Syria and Libya, regime change operations where, again, Saudi and other Gulf Arab monarchies with the U.S. have supported extremist groups. Medea, I want to ask you, given this history, where do we stand now in terms of the U.S. Saudi relationship. We saw nearly a break, the biggest bump perhaps, 1973 oil embargo with the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. But uh, what has been the real fallout from that? Where do we stand now? Well, as you said in the history, the beginning of the relationship in many years revolved around oil. Uh, now the United States does not need Saudi oil, but it does want to control access to Saudi oil and the global oil supply in general. But since um, the flow of tremendous amounts of petrodollars into the U.S. economy, the U.S. has a relationship now that depends a lot on the hundreds of billions of dollars that the Saudis invest in the United States in all sectors of the U.S. economy, including U.S. Treasury bonds. There's tremendous amount of Saudi money in the high-tech sector. And then on top of that, as you mentioned, there is the purchase of U.S. weapons. That has become very big business in the United States. Donald Trump touts it as an important uh, source for U.S. jobs and thinks that that is more important than punishing Saudi Arabia for uh, the death of Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, there is, of course, the uh, Saudi participation in the war in Yemen that has been so devastating for Yemen, uh, but where the U.S. has supplied the weapons for doing that. Uh, these weapons we supply to Saudi Arabia don't just sit in some warehouse. They're being used to kill Yemenis every single day. Uh, the death of Khashoggi now a year ago uh, did put a crimp in that relationship in that businesses were uh, for a short time worried about how it looked to be dealing with such a repressive regime. But since then, uh, many of those businesses have gone back to working with Saudi Arabia there is a big business um, gathering that happens every year that will be going on at the end of October. Uh, last year, a lot of businesses decided not to go. Uh, this year, it looks like many of them will be going back again. Thank you again for joining us. And I, I just wanted, that leads me to my first question, which is uh, the uh, regarding the coverage of Khashoggi's murder. And I wanted to ask you, what impact that coverage has on the public's perception, especially in the United States, of the situation in Yemen and other aspects of the Saudi regime's policies, including women's rights and LGBT rights in Saudi Arabia. Are those subjects drowned out by the coverage of Khashoggi's murder or does it kind of bring new light to them? Does it bring new, a new spotlight onto those subjects as well, in your opinion? I think it actually brings new light to them because before Khashoggi murder, uh, you had this very, very repressive country um, that really uh, did not get scrutiny. What got scrutiny was Iran because the U.S. narrative was that Iran is the biggest exporter of terrorism in the world and that we need our Saudi allies to fight against Iran. Uh, after Khashoggi's murder, uh, there has been more attention to the fact that the same crown prince that was supposed to be a reformer, in fact, is... Uh, increasing the repression internally in the country, cracking down on the very women activists who fought for the right to drive, which he is credited for, quote, giving women, uh, cracking down on any dissidents. So I think in that sense, there is more scrutiny uh, for these other abuses in Saudi Arabia that were totally glossed over before Khashoggi's murder. Did you have any thoughts on the sort of non-answers that uh, MBS gave on the subject of the women, the, the female activists that are imprisoned in Saudi Arabia when he was asked that about that recently on the 60 Minutes interview? Well, he uh, gave a ridiculous answer that, uh, oh my goodness, what are these allegations of women being tortured? I'll have to look into that. Um, 
you know, he is the one who ordered these women to be imprisoned. Uh, he knows very well what has been happening to them because it happened exactly at the same time that he announced that women would have the right to drive. He took those women, uh, some of whom had fought for decades, uh, and put them in prison, sending a very clear message to women all over Saudi Arabia, don't ask for any reforms. I am the one who will ask, uh, who will give them to you. Uh, in fact, when women uh, were fighting for the right to drive, they were also fighting for much broader reforms that would be an end to what's called the guardianship system, where women from the day they're born to the day they die have to have a male relative who is in charge of the most important aspects of their lives. This is something that was also eased up by the crown prince recently, but certainly the guardianship system was not lifted and the women who fought for an end to it are still in prison. So as Joe described a moment ago, you know, the, the historical US relationship with Saudi Arabia, you know, and we know that that historical support has been championed by both the Democrats and the Republicans when they've been in the, in the White House. You know, what does it, would it take, in your opinion, to see the U.S. actually sever its support of Saudi Arabia? Or would that ever be possible, given the role of the petrodollar in ensuring the U.S.'s global, you know, control? It's basically its empire. Well, if you had asked me that question perhaps a little over a year ago, I would say maybe something spectacular, like a Washington Post journalist being lured into a Saudi consulate and chopped up with a bone saw and then his uh, uh, bones melted down with the chemical and, uh, and it traced back to the crown prince. Well, actually that did happen and it didn't sever the relationship. So I have no idea at this point. It's not going to be President Trump because obviously if this didn't do it for him, uh, I can't imagine what will. Um, but um, there is an interesting change in the relationship, and that is that after the September 14th attack on the Saudi oil facilities, um, the Houthis having claimed uh, the responsibility, but the Saudis and the U.S. blaming Iran, um, there was no real retaliation on the part of the United States. Yes, they sent uh, 200 more troops to the region and more uh, war material, but there was uh, so far no military attack and um, the U.S. has been relatively quiet on that. Uh, and so I think that sends somewhat of a message to Saudi Arabia, uh, don't count on us to jump in and fight a war with Iran for you. Uh, so, so far, um, it looks like the um, Trump administration does not want to get itself into a war with Iran on behalf of Saudi Arabia or Israel for that matter. That's so fascinating considering and in context of those historic arms deals that Trump did sign with Saudi Arabia. But that that your discussion of Khashoggi re leads me into my last question before I hand it back to Joe. I just wanted to ask how you would compare or you know basically contrast the media, especially Western media's response to Khashoggi's death, its coverage of his death, with the lack of coverage and the, the basically, you know, propaganda uh, in response to the imprisonment and the continued persecution in the West of uh, journalist Julian Assange. It is quite remarkable that there is so little coverage of not only uh, the follow-up of Khashoggi's murder, because there has been nobody that has been held accountable for this. The trials started in January, have been dragging on. Uh, the Saudis won't even release the names of who is on trial, but we know that the mastermind of this is Mohammed bin Salman himself. Uh, and that is according to the CIA as well as the United Nations. Uh, and uh, we also know that uh, there has been very little coverage of the uh, women that are in prison, the bloggers that are in prison, uh, the human rights lawyers that defend these activists who are in prison, uh, the Shia minority who are uh, constantly being discriminated against. You know, it's interesting, there is a big initiative on the part of the Trump administration around freedom of religion. In fact, it seems like religion is the only human rights issue that this administration cares about, and that might be a bone that has been thrown to Mike Pence and Mike Pompeo. Uh, but when they have these international gatherings uh, to focus on freedom of religion, uh, the uh, perhaps worst place in the world that is not talked about is Saudi Arabia, 
where there is um, absolutely no right to practice a religion other than Islam. And in fact, even the Shia minority are discriminated against. It's illegal to have a church. Uh, certainly would be illegal to have a synagogue um, or uh, to openly practice uh, Judaism or Catholicism. And yet this human right it's violation uh, is not even brought up by this administration. So there are all kinds of human rights violations in Saudi Arabia. And uh, I did mention that the U.S. portrays Iran as the largest exporter of terrorism, but really um, it, Saudi Arabia is much more culpable. Let's not forget that 15 of the 19 hijackers of 9-11 were Saudis, yet Saudis were not put on the Muslim ban, uh, and that Saudi Arabia continues to export its uh, perversion of Islam called Wahhabism, and that even the textbooks used inside Saudi Arabia, which the United States has been saying year after year since 9-11, you must stop using textbooks uh, that portray non-Muslims as heretics, um, and yet they continue to use those kinds of textbooks. So the U.S. Uh, not only doesn't publicize, but doesn't try to hold Saudi Arabia accountable for any of these violations. They didn't even throw the Saudis a bone sore, let alone a bone, uh, when it comes to that religion, the religious issue. I mean, I, uh, I spent three days in Jeddah, and the thing that I've lasted remember is looking at a bank and a fast food joint and seeing male entrance on one side and female on the other, and the discrimination reminiscent of the South in the, uh, the days of segregation here in the U.S. Uh, you know, uh, Elizabeth asked you about uh, uh, Julian Assange. Now, the Western media, corporate media, for the most part, says that, he, like the government, uh, he's not a journalist, okay? And, and clearly he is. He's a publisher, and he not only publishes material, but he speaks and writes about it and understands it and analyzes it. That makes him a journalist in my book. But the Khashoggi is, well, actually was not really a journalist. He was a propagandist for the regime uh, through many decades, going back to the 1980 war in Afghanistan. But what happened was he fell out. His prince, who was sponsoring him, fell out with... Mohammed bin Salman, when, when he, uh, uh, bin Salman arrested those princes and other members of the royal family into five-star hotels for a while, confiscated a lot of their wealth. He was purging when he took over. So Khashoggi then became persona non grata and he came to the U.S. Yes, he wrote mildly critical articles of Saudi Arabia. No one could defend in any way what happened to him. But you have to wonder why... Uh, our beautiful liberal corporate media does not get upset about Julian Assange being arrested. They didn't really get upset about oh, the slaughter going on in Yemen. They didn't really get upset about other things. Maybe the women's issue to some extent. But when this one of their own is killed, that's when they snapped into action and caused an unbelievable reaction in Congress, which I also wanted to talk about. Yes, it is uh, quite remarkable that the Saudis uh, could get away with uh, war crimes on a daily basis in Yemen with U.S. complicity, uh, and that that didn't seem to bother people in Congress, uh, particularly the Republicans. You know, I spend a lot of time in Congress. I would go to the hearings all the time and be pleading with the uh, members of the Foreign Affairs and the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, do something about Yemen. People are dying every single day. We would take in pictures of starving babies and get arrested for holding them up. Um, but it didn't uh, uh, touch the hearts of these cold-hearted people in Congress uh, until, as you said, one of their own, uh, a Washington Post journalist. And um, to Washington Post's credit, although I, I hate to credit them for very much, um, they did continue and have continued to uh, write um, article after article after article uh, about Khashoggi. And so people were reading about it and uh, the Inside the Beltway um, uh, Mafia in Congress was reading about it, and people like uh, Lindsey Graham, who had been great supporters of the Saudis, of the Saudi-led war in Yemen, uh, suddenly, as he said, pissed off. Uh, he said this guy was a wrecking ball, Mohammed bin Salman, and uh, he, uh, he turned around. And because of people like him, we did manage to get votes passed through both the House and the Senate, calling for a cutoff of U.S. support to uh, the Saudi war in Yemen. It is quite remarkable that it took the death of Khashoggi to do that. Now, of course, 
Donald Trump used his veto power uh, to veto those bills. And uh, Congress is trying through other means, such as an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act, uh, to try to force his hand. Uh, but uh, the, the war hawks in Congress, uh, several of them, did, uh, did a turnabout. And because of that, we have had some successful votes in Congress on this. Now, I don't say that this was a vote to cut off all weapon sales to Saudi Arabia, only a minor portion of them. Uh, and these same people will go back very soon uh, to embracing Saudi Arabia once there is uh, something that they can uh, use as accountability. Uh, maybe when these trials end and uh, somebody's head is chopped off for this. Uh, but in the meantime, there has been a very large coalition of human rights groups, peace groups, humanitarian organizations that has put enough pressure on Congress to get us this far. Now, this legislation, let's say it carries over uh, to the next Congress and uh, we have a new president. Where do you, some of the Democratic candidates stand on Yemen and financing that, you know? Well, they're tired of this war and they uh, are tired of uh, the UN saying that the US might be complicit in these war crimes. And there is, as I said, quite a coalition. You know, when I mentioned the groups as part of the coalition, I failed to mention that it's a left-right coalition, that there are many groups who are a part of the libertarian community, uh, Republican groups uh, that are financed by the Koch brothers, Freedom Works, they're part of this coalition. Uh, the American people don't want the US to go into another war in uh, the Middle East and they're tired of the ones that exist. When there were polls done asking Americans how they would feel about the US intervening militarily uh, in the Middle East on behalf of, of Saudi Arabia, only 16% of the American public was in favor of that. So I think with the new president, uh, we would be able to stop the support for the war in Yemen. In his interview on 60 Minutes, um, Bin Salman, talked about, uh, he actually said he did not want war with Iran and he hoped that there could be some diplomatic resolution. Uh, but of course he was ready to go to war if necessary. But he said it would cause the collapse of the world economy. That's all correct. But he called that attack that, uh, that they blame, that Saudis and Pompeo, et cetera, blame on Iran, but that the Houthis took responsibility for. He said that that was Iran being stupid. And Pompeo, Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State, said it was an act of war. Now, it, that is a stupid remark. And I said, why? Because, yes, it was an act of war in the middle of a war. Uh, they conveniently have got, excised out the Yemen war that Saudi Arabia started. Sometimes you have to see who started it, right? And in this case, Saudis clearly started it. They started it, as I wrote, based on a scoop that I had from the UN Special Envoy at the time, Jamal uh, Benomar, that uh, Saudi Arabia was worried that he was too close to a deal. And they could not allow anything looking like democracy with 30% women in the parliament to exist on their own peninsula, let alone uh, in the whole region, let alone on their own peninsula. So they went to war. They started that war. This attack on the oil installations was a punch in the nose to the guys who started this war. And I think it's interesting. You say like they may not go to war in response. And I think it's because they realize and that Iranians realize they can get away with this counterattack through the Houthis. Um, because they are powerless, the U.S. and Saudi Arabia, to start this war that they know will be devastating for all sides. Is that what you think as well? The Iranians have been preparing for a war with the United States for many years. Uh, they have the logistical capability of attacking U.S. bases that surround uh, Iran. Uh, that includes bases in Iraq, uh, bases in, uh, well, U.S. forces in um, in uh, Syria, U.S. forces in, or, or their allies like the Israelis with their uh, allies in, in Hezbollah. Um, they also uh, have many allies inside Iraq itself. Uh, in Afghanistan, they're able to hit U.S. forces. Also in the Persian Gulf, uh, they are able to stop the shipment of oil as they have proven. And so whether it's by air, by sea, or by land, the Iranians are prepared. Now, uh, yes, they would get attacked terribly, and it would be awful for Iran as well. But it is awful for Iran right now. The sanctions are devastating. And the U.S. imperial hubris to not only 
pull out of the Iran nuclear deal, but tell re the rest of the world that they can't trade with Iran, uh, is driving Iran to the point of desperation uh, to be uh, doing these kinds of attacks uh, to say, hey, um, if this is the way you're going to make it, they've even said openly, if you're not going to let Iran sell its oil, uh, then other countries are not going to be able to sell their oil either. So yes, this is started, uh, as you said, the, the war in Yemen was um, uh, started with the intervention of the Saudis in an internal affair, but the conflict with Iran was started by Donald Trump, totally manufactured by Donald Trump. And uh, he bit off more than he could chew because the Iranians are prepared to defend themselves. Indeed, uh, Trump uh, undoing the, the only really major accomplishment of the Obama administration, the nuclear deal. Um, I want to end by asking you, uh, a writer uh, at Conservative News, after, in the time of the Khashoggi uh, murder, wrote that this is the end of the House of Saud. It's going to fall. Now, I've been hearing that for a long time. Books have been written about it. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. I argue that it would not happen, that this would be forgotten for the most part. It would be patched up. And I think I've just been borne out to be correct the, that has not brought the House of Saud down. However, it is the CIA that says that bin Salman was directly involved in the murder. And you got to wonder about that. Why would the CIA say that? And do you think it's because they wanted to see not Saudi, uh, the House of Saud fall, but bin Salman to fall because he's reckless. He's out of control. They may not be able to control him like they could others. And they preferred Bin Nayev, who was previous crown prince, to come back. Do you think that that was what was behind the, the, the CIA trying to do this? And they have failed if, they, if that's what they wanted. Absolutely. And I think that, uh, I still think that Mohammed Bin Salman uh, is uh, seen as a liability by not only the CIA, but people in the uh, royal house inside Saudi Arabia. Uh, I think his days are numbered. Uh, they just haven't, uh, his time has not come yet, uh, but I don't think he continue, can continue really as um, the head of state there when he is so ruthless and so reckless, uh, as uh, Lindsey Graham said, a wrecking ball. Uh, so um, I think we should watch carefully what happens inside Saudi Arabia, uh, and there might very well be some shakeup in the House of Saud, uh, but... Um, uh, it is very difficult to predict what happens internally. But remember, when he took about 200 uh, very wealthy individuals and shook them down in the Ritz-Carlton, uh, including uh, not only grabbing billions of dollars, but including things like torture, um, this guy has a lot of enemies. And I don't think they're sitting by idly. Uh, I think there's a lot of coup plotting inside Saudi Arabia. And... Uh, given that there are still many businesses that are afraid to do business with this crown prince, that this September 14th attack uh, has affected the, um, uh, the uh, perception among the uh, financial community about investing in Saudi Aramco, uh, there may well be people inside the royal family who think that uh, their best bet is to push Mohammed bin Salman aside for somebody more, uh, quote, reliable. Well, we know how shaken up things are when Medea Benjamin is quoting Lindsey Graham positively. So uh, we want to thank you for joining us, uh, Medea, and I hope we talk again soon on the ongoing drama of U.S.-Saudi relations. You're watching CN Live.